Yeah, that'll get everybody's attention. Um, can you take the echo off for now? Echo. This is a singing microphone, so I'm going to have to learn how to sing. Let's see. They won't let me sing or clap because I can't keep a beat. Now my beautiful wife up here, she's, she's the one doing the drums, and I, I was just amazed. I'm amazing. Um, speaking of music, the songs that you heard playing when you came into church and the songs that we're just playing now is from um, Mimi, Naomi. Um, she has a CD out, and she's been singing since before I was born. And uh, she is wonderful, heavenly angel voice. And um, she is, like, famous around this area for her beautiful um, vocal cords. Um, she does many uh, funerals and different things like that. And she just has a heart for the Lord. And, and um, I'm glad that she puts it on a CD so we can listen to it any time. So if you, if you like a CD, uh, talk to Naomi. Um, just a little announcement before I go. After church, we're going to go to my house. And it's that way, okay? <laughs> it's 503 East 7th. This is 6th Street right here. So right behind us is 7th Street, and you, you won't miss all the vehicles. There will be vehicles everywhere. Yeah. Parking. Yeah, parking, I was going to get to that. Um, if there's nowhere to park in front of my house or anywhere around my house, and feel free to park in Paul Brown's yard. Um, <laughs> but uh, in... No, I, I, what I was going to say is we can park in this field right here. You'll see a steel tank where I used to try to burn things before the Department of DEQ shut me down. Um, <laughs> there's this huge steel tank right, right across kind of caddy corner from my house. There's a big field there. We own that field. So it's like a, a lot or two that way. You'll see it. You'll see the steel tank. Um, I'm told DEQ comes by once a month and looks to see if there's any new ashes in there. Uh, but anyways, it's there. You can't miss it. It makes a really neat fire. I wanna, and we got plenty of time today because we're eating afterwards. So Monty's going to take as much time as he wants, and so am I. And everybody's like, I see one of them guys in the back saying, hey, man, that's good. Preach it, right? But I want to talk to you, June 8th was our anniversary, it's been five years, and uh, we've had some ups and downs during those five years. I will say five years ago, um, or just over five years ago, I was uh, uh, switch hitting preaching at the Prairie Hill Baptist Church, and um, my brother-in-law had come up to me and said, will you pastor this church because it's going to go away you know because I'm closing the doors well I didn't know what to do so we prayed about it because we were enjoying what we were doing and uh, I says Lord give me a, a sign that even a child can understand because you know I'm not that bright uh, I mean you know when my wife had liked me it almost took a sledgehammer to realize that she actually liked me um, so I think she used one on me a couple times, but that's, um, but anyways, my littlest one, she didn't know what I'd asked for, and she had a lot of friends at Prairie Hill Church, and she didn't want to leave that church, and uh, so she had told us several times that, you know, we want, we, she would like to stay there because there was a lot of kids, and, and um, but one day, several days later, she had come up to me and she said, uh, she said, Dad, I've been thinking. And I said, yeah. And I mean, she, that was five years ago, so that, I don't know how old she is now, but <laughs> she would have been seven, okay. So she says, Dad, you know, I like them kids at uh, Prairie Hill, but, you know, if we, we, we need to go to that new church um, because they need us. And uh, she said, I'll make new friends. Well, I asked for something that a child could understand, so I had a seven-year-old tell me what to do. <laughs> so I was on board, 
and my wife she had said well i'm not i'm not there yet and so about a couple of days later she had come up to me and said you know what i've been praying and i think we need to do this well then we went over there and the ceiling fell out i mean everything fell the floor fell everything nothing worked right and i don't want to get into all that but next thing you know we were without a building and we are homeless church and then uh the somebody had mentioned well let's just have church in the lusty community center so what we did was we changed our name got a new name and went to a little lusty community center and then uh then uh somebody had said well let's have church in this building because it was vacant now i'm not from around here and i didn't even i mean i drive up and down this road and i didn't even know there was a building here and then we went in this building and uh where you're sitting now was just an open floor with probably six feet of junk that was in here and there's a little pathway to get through there was only one way from that side to this side it was a little pathway the school had put all kind of stuff in here and then the basement the ceiling in the basement was on the floor and there was glass and beer bottles and beer cans and all kinds of stuff on that floor down in the basement and we came in and cleaned it up and then one day not too long after that we decided we're going to have a garage sale to raise some money for the church so we had all this stuff up here we weren't even having church up here it was deplorable you couldn't have church up here we was having church in the basement we cleaned the basement first because it was cooler and we didn't even have air conditioning at the time so anyways we had this big garage sale and didn't sell anything but made lots of money, not lots, but we made some money. So then we're like, what are we going to do with all this stuff that we have? Well, there was an empty building downtown, and uh, we d somehow we ended up with this building, and we opened up a thrift store called Divine Array. And uh, it's kind of funny how we named that thing. We put some names in a hat, you know, kind of like casting lots. And then Divine Array name was in that hat. So we pulled out the name. It's Divine Array. We're like, well, we're not sure about that. Let's mix up the hat again. I think we did that two or three times, and it came out Divine Array every time. Uh, so in the theory of that is, is in Matthew, I believe, where he says, you know, he have arrayed the flowers, being arrayed by God, being provided for by God. And um, so what we have now is we have this thrift store now. So God has blessed us. But over that turn of events throughout the years, um, you know, I, I listen to preachers and I, I hear a lot of people today taking credit for what God has done when they're preaching and uh, in their salvation, everything. Um, you know, it's a, a lot of what's going on today is a glorified man instead of God. So we've taken a turn because this is, uh, was pressed on my heart that to God be the glory, not to man. To God be the glory. And as we started giving God the glory, people would get mad and leave. People got mad and leave the church. So we've had these ups and downs. It's always been a struggle. Do we not say what we believe or do we say what we believe and let the chips fall? And Monty's been such a help we met him probably at a time of our greatest need and he says to me he says you just keep preaching what you're preaching he says you preach the truth and let the chips fall and then we're studying john we're going through the book of john and my wife had come up to me and she says you know i never realized this i think it's john chapter five or six but where jesus feeds the five thousand he had masses and masses and masses following him that day and he fed them all, created bread, created food. And at the end of the day, he was left with very few, probably 11 people. So if Jesus himself preached the 5,000 and more and ended up with 11 at the end of the day, so I guess I'm doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> but he preached the truth. And a lot of times people don't want to hear the truth. They want the bread, they want the food, but they don't want the truth. And our job, no matter how big or how small we are, is to continue preaching the truth. 
And um, I got to say, you know, uh, two weeks ago, I, I preached a sermon on um, as I've loved you, love one another. Jesus told us that in John. And this good lit church has fulfilled that. Um, I called Monty and I says, hey, would you like to guest preach? Well, guys, this is Sunday, okay? And um, their church is closed, I guess. I assume they're closed, either that or half of them just came up because, you know. No, it's closed, okay? So he says, do you mind if we come up and worship with you and celebrate these five years? And that is something. I mean, to close your church, drive 45 minutes to worship with another church is love. That is dedication and love to another group that's trying. We're probably five to ten years behind them in our growth but they have some wisdom that we need and uh, like Jesus said and John said little children I give you this commandment so we can learn from them and that's why I invited Monty to come and speak today if you will come come on up Am I on? All right, now we're cooking. <laughs> Take your Bibles if you would, and I want you to turn to the wonderful book of Ephesians. Ephesians, and when you find Ephesians, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. I have often been asked before by a lot of people, if you had to do a synopsis of the gospel and as the gospel applies to man and the grace of God, what chapter would you use? And my answer is always Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Follow along with me as I read. If you don't mind, would you stand as, the, as God's Word is read? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love in which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved, and raised up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is the text of the message. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And may the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word this morning. Y'all may be seated. The title of today's sermon is simply this. What must I do? What must I do? Today we live in a time where biblical truth is very much in short supply. The gospel, the good news of Christ, has been bent, warped, and twisted and modified to please our self-edifying egos. Today in so many churches, salvation is being presented as something we do. Something that we decide out of our fallen, depraved natures. Salvation is being taught as a possibility 
a partnership, if you will, between us and God with the ball, with the ball very much resting in our court. We are being taught that we are the deciders of our destiny, the masters of our fate. All that we have to do is hold the pastor's hand and repeat a prayer after him and salvation is poured out upon you. Let me be very, very clear this morning as someone who was raised in that kind of an environment. The sinner's prayer is completely and totally unbiblical. If that makes you uncomfortable, maybe you needed to hear some truth. You see, easy believism and name it, claim it is the specialty of the day at so many of our churches. This is propagated by a society that has become totally man-centered, totally man-controlled. It is watered by pastors and denominations who have usurped God's sovereignty in favor of man's approval. Can you relate to that this morning? The gospel that is presented today is not offensive in any sense. But let me say this to you dear people. The gospel was meant to be offensive. It was meant to point out the differences between us and God. It was meant to point out our sinful condition and our absolute need of Him. The gospel that is preached today does not point at sin, but rather instead it tells us how good we are. It tells people that you can have your best life now. The only thing it takes is a little positive thinking. When Joel Osteen comes on the TV, turn the channel or turn it off. People want a gospel that makes them feel good about themselves. They want a pep rally to lift them up to some kind of an emotional experience, religious experience, rather than looking at how they truly do stand before God. Decisional regeneration. Decisional regeneration I declared war on a number of years ago because it is sending millions upon millions of people to a devil's hell because the truth of this doctrine is a massive lie. Now contrary to popular opinion this morning, we do not save ourselves in any sense of the word. We do not dictate our salvation, but rather God's salvation is very much a gift of His divine and sovereign grace, and it is His grace alone. A number of years ago, uh, my wife and I went to the movies at Altus. We, come, we go over here quite frequently. And uh, as the movie was waiting to start, we saw an ad... One Way Christian Center. And something caught my attention as I was watching that screen. And it said, Reformed. And I said, Praise God, we're not alone. The Reformed faith is very, very old. It is some of the oldest in the United States of America. But I've got good news. The Reformed faith is coming back. Because people need to hear the truth. They need to hear about God's sovereignty and His grace and that nothing without His approval ever happens. It did my heart good. And you're celebrating five years. You've gone through growing pains. Sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. But I am reminded of a verse because much like you, we went through a lot of the same growing pains. 
But a verse kept popping in my mind from the Bible which says this, they went out from us because they were never part of us. God has a way of putting a church together. And when a church starts seeking truth, when you start questioning things that you've been taught all your life, and rather instead get into the Word of God and find out what they actually say, things will start to happen. God can use a church like that. He can use a people like that. Salvation is by God's grace and by God's grace alone. Now there's some of you here this morning that might say, but pastor, there's got to be something that I have to do. The thing is this. What we have to do is to simply believe. And I'm going to lay something really heavy on you right now. That belief is totally and completely a gift of God's grace. You cannot manufacture your own belief. We are a fallen people with a fallen nature. And I hear so many people that say this, I am seeking after God. No, you're not. The Bible says that no man seeks after God. No, not one. But I am glad that God came seeking after His sheep. So therefore, we have no reason to boast. We have no reason to boast about absolutely anything we have done because we have not done anything that was not given to us by God the Father. And that, my dear friends, includes our belief in Jesus Christ. It was not our decision. Rather, it was God's sovereign choice. Can you stand something else heavy this morning? Here we go. I had a man one time ask me, he said, Don't you think... Can I move around a little bit? He said... Don't you think that God gets tired of writing down all of those names when people are saved? I knew this man was an Armenian. And I said, no. I said, I want to tell you why. Because God had the names of His elect written before the foundation of the world. If you believe in Jesus Christ today, it is because God intervened in your life and wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. And He sent Jesus Christ, His Son, to come and die for the sins of His elect and secure our salvation forever and forever. What do we have to boast about? You see, I believe this morning that this statement that I'm talking about, it doesn't play well with our pride. It doesn't do well with our so-called free will. But it is nonetheless spiritually true. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 25 through 34, we read of a Philippian jailer. And we read about his miraculous conversion. And a question that he asked that is quite profound. He said, what must I do to be saved? You see, we have to know a little bit about that story. Paul and Silas were in jail for preaching the gospel. They were in jail when a great earthquake shook the the jail and it freed the prisoners. Their bonds were broken loose and the doors of the prison swung wide open. Now I want you to put yourself in the jailer's shoes just for a minute. If the jailer was in charge of this, he was panicked for his life. 
He saw the doors open and he assumed that the prisoners had got away and escaped. He was very much in fear for his life. He was about to kill himself when Paul assured him, no one's missing. We're still here. We're still here. In dire distress, this Philippian jailer fell down in front of Paul and Silas and he posed this question. Now perhaps he'd been listening to their prayers. Perhaps he'd been listening to them singing songs. You know, they had a reason to offer prayer and they had a reason to sing songs. It doesn't make any difference where you are in your life or what prison you think you're in. If God's in charge, He's got it covered. If God loves you, He's got it covered. There's no circumstance that He can't deliver you from and no prison doors that He can't open. You want to talk about peace with God? To know where you are in the circumstance that you're in but you know that God is going to work everything out for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. Because God works all things together for good. Somehow He must have known though that He was guilty. Guilty before God. And He needed to be saved from God's judgment. I was there. Anybody else there in that point? And the answer? Very simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now, Paul and Silas were not saying to simply affirm something that was true. Believing in Jesus is not just merely knowing true things about Him and agreeing with them. However, to be sure, this is a part of it. But the person who believes also is going to trust God to provide forgiveness for their sins and bring them into eternal life with God Himself. But belief in Jesus most certainly requires knowledge. It requires a knowledge of who He is and what He has done. As a result of that knowledge, we have a dependence on Him and Him alone to save. Do you remember the old song, My hope is built on nothing less Then Jesus' blood and righteousness on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see, belief in Jesus is what is required for our salvation. In our church, we have the five banners of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola Christus, Christ alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. And sola de gloria, for the glory of God alone. Belief in Jesus is what is required. This is the faith alone that the reformers taught. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ Faith alone in that Scripture. Faith alone in that grace. In Christ alone. And for the absolute glory of God alone. But there's a little bit deeper. What does it mean? What does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus? What does it mean? It is to trust in the crucified and the risen Jesus and to trust in what His death and in what His resurrection accomplished. Faith is the activity which takes men and women right out of themselves and it makes them one with Christ. And all of this is a gift of God and God's grace alone. You see, here's what we've got to do. We've got to start looking away from ourselves 
And we have to look at Christ and His finished work and not ours. Dear church, dear brothers and sisters, whatever background that you came from, our good works are as filthy rags. They mean nothing. The only thing that we have is God's grace. The only reason that I'm standing up here preaching to you today is because God's grace. Everything that I am or everything that I will ever hope to be is by God's grace and by God's grace alone. I didn't deserve it. I did not deserve God's grace. None of us did. And this thing of being God's children, God's elect, those that He has called out of the darkness and into the light is not something for us to boast about, but it is something for us to be humbled by. Why me, God, did you reveal yourself to me? You know, Jesus prayed a prayer. He said, thank you, Father, for hearing me. For giving me all authority and I will reveal myself to anyone I choose. There are some times that God does not reveal Himself to everybody. But He reveals Himself to His sheep. The Bible tells us, I know my sheep. I know their voice and I call them out by name. And they will follow me. They won't follow somebody else. Boy, the Pharisees didn't like that, Paul. They didn't like it. We are sons of Abraham. We are the elite. But Jesus said to him, He said, here's why you can't believe in me. You're not my sheep. You're not my sheep. We've got to look away from ourselves. The honor and glory of our salvation starts and ends with God. He is the architect. He is the writer. He is the finisher. And our salvation very much belongs to Him alone. So tell me, what have we contributed to this salvation story? What have we contributed? The only thing that we have contributed to this story, as best as I can tell, is the sin that we need to be delivered from. Jesus declared some very deep and powerful things in Scripture. And if people would take their time to read their Bibles, are you going through the Gospel of John? God bless you because the Gospel of John is a deep book. John chapter 6 is one of my personal favorites, and here we go. Here is what Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 65. No one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. And in the same passage, Jesus declares, All that the Father gives to me will come to me. Now let's skip over a little bit, shall we? Can I walk around? John chapter 17 contained a wonderful prayer by Jesus. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew it from the very beginning. And He was offering a prayer to His Father. And here's what he said. My prayer is not for the world, but for those that you have given me. Some of the disciples asked him, well, what's the will of God? And here's what he said. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those that He has given me, but I should raise them to life at the last day. You remember another prayer, Father, I give you thanks. Everything came from you. They were yours. Did you catch that? 
They were yours and then you gave them to me. What do we got to boast about? Sometimes we don't see God orchestrating in our lives at the present. But we look back in retrospect and we can see God with His hand on our back shaping our lives. There's a reason that God brought people to this church. There's reasons that He brought a wonderful pastor and wonderful people to this church. He did it for a reason. And it's all in Him. To God be the glory. Now now you pointed out something very interesting. A lot of times pastors will will sometimes get a little bit overzealous. Now come down here, son, and pray this prayer with me and we will pronounce you saved. I'm sorry, but no pastor, nowhere of any denomination has that authority. I mean, we've, we've got this chunk em and dunk em attitude right now. Drag them in. Let's have a pizza supper for Christ and let's get a bunch of little kids and we're going to pronounce them saved and then we're going to run them through the sheep dip of baptism and we're going to send them out the same way that they went in. All they're going to be is wet. Well, they were saved. I mean, they professed Jesus Christ. There's more to it than professing with your mouth. It is how you live your life. Now that may not be popular, but it's very much biblical. Sometimes we need to hold back on that zeal to see if anything really happened. Because I don't know about you, but my Bible tells me if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have gone, and behold, new things have come. New things have come. So when Jesus begins to work on your heart, and if you know Jesus, you know that at some point in your life, He stepped in and He intervened in your life. You're on the wrong course. You know, I could go to church every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. I could do everything. I could read through that Bible. I could do everything that I possibly could. And I could not save myself. And if Jesus had not intervened on the behalf of sinners like us, if He had not put in our hearts through the power of His Holy Spirit, the knowledge that He was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we would be lost and without hope. But then Paul adds those two words and he says, But God intervened. You remember the old song, uh, He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know He touched me and made me whole. It was not of your doing. It is totally a gift of God's incredible and immaculate grace. There is a time for every believer, every person that God has given to Jesus Christ, an hour of of decision of salvation when He throws out His rope. Now we're in the same part of the country. We understand ropes. When He throws out that rope and He begins to draw us to Him, come to me. Come to me. Now let me get country. Can I do that? I think I'm in the right place. I can do that. People used to draw water from a well and they had a bucket on it. And they'd lower it. We called them a cistern. And they'd lower it down into a cistern and they'd get water. Now, here's what some evangelicals try to describe the drawing experience like. 
Jesus would come over there or somebody would come over there or a pastor would come over there and he'd say, come here, bucket of water. Come here, come here, come here. Come on. Did you catch that? When Jesus touches your heart, When He calls your name and says, Come to Me. You know what He's saying? He is saying, Believe in Me. The words are interchangeable. Believe in Me. And He grants you that wonderful gift of belief. Isn't God good? He grants you that gift of belief. And you're pulled to Him irresistibly. Oh yes, brother, I believe very much in irresistible grace. It's a grace for whom it was intended. And you can't resist it, you're going to come to Him. Let me go back and let me recite that verse again. All that the Father gives to me will... Come to me. Will. It doesn't say might. Doesn't say could. Doesn't say probably. But it says, Will come to me. Man, church, we ought to be thankful for what God has done for us in giving us that wonderful gift of belief and faith in Him because we couldn't get it. There's no way we could get it. We can't manufacture our own faith. Well, well, how do you how do you know you can't manufacture your own faith? Because I've got a fallen nature. I was born in something called total depravity. Good for nothing. Dead in sins and trespasses. But when Christ comes into our life, here's what He does. He resuscitates us. He makes us alive. He calls us His own. And He washes us clean by His blood. And He calls us His own. He calls us His own. It is by grace that you have been saved. Is there anything greater than grace? I think not. Grace plus anything else ceases to be grace. But we always keep trying to add to it. Well, if I memorize an extra Bible verse this week, maybe I'll get it. Maybe if I'm good to my neighbor over there and I carry her groceries in, maybe I'll get it. Maybe if I take Pastor Brian out to to uh, uh, Taco Bell, maybe I'll get a little more grace that way. Keep going, Pastor. Keep going. We're not going to get any more grace. God has bestowed upon us the depths and the riches of His grace. Paul Stidham, he uses a word called lavished. When you're lavished with God's grace, it is poured all over you. Did we deserve it? Absolutely not. But why did God choose to give it? Because it was His choice and His authority. And it is by Him and Him alone that you are saved. And so when somebody says, well... I remember that day that I was saved. I remember that day that I gave my life to Christ. Well, how do you remember it? Well, I took a tomato steak and I went out in the yard and I drove it into the ground and I said, look here, devil, this proves that I'm saved. No, it doesn't. All that does is prove you drove a steak in the ground. But your life that is changed is the result of something that God did within you. Stick to the truth. Regardless, stick to the truth. So many churches anymore, I don't know how you rightly call them churches. They're little more than social clubs and entertainment centers. Pastor Brian, I'm fairly sure, feels the very same way I am. I want my people and I want you to learn. 
to learn. There was a time when very much was made of God. But then man got his finger in it. And then we started trying to make it more about us than it was about God, more about our decision than it was about God's. Well, that's simply not biblical. Everything that I am, everything that you are, is because but God intervened and showed you incredible, incredible grace upon grace. Present the truth. Stand on it. You know, there's people. You were, I, I know the struggles that you went through. We went through a lot of the same struggles. It's not a personal thing, though, between people. That's where we've got to get it straight. Love the people who left. And pray for them that someday, someday, a light will go off. Someday that we can swallow that pride. And sometimes pride is a very difficult thing to get down. You can't get it down with bread or water. Because sometimes it swells up. But don't ever stop preaching about grace, brother, because that's all we have. That's all we have. When you go through those struggles, keep asking God for grace. Keep asking Him for wisdom. Keep asking you to keep you humble. Something changed in that Philippian jailer. He went from a position of authority to a position of submission. And when he went to that position of submission, that's when God was able to use him. But God had a plan for him from the very beginning. Just like He had for Paul who wrote that particular text. Paul was the persecutor of the Christians. The chief witness at the stoning of Saul, of Stephen, excuse me, and he didn't, Man, he wanted to persecute the church. He wanted to uphold the law. But he had a Damascus Road experience, best as I read. And God made him realize that his life was going to head in a different direction. In spite of all he thought he knew, he knew nothing. But then he began to realize the full depths of God's grace and goodness upon his life. To the extent that this brother, Brother Leon Couch, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Because God's grace shone upon him. God's grace shone upon him. And he shows upon you. I want one way Christian sinner to flourish and to prosper. But if we do if we don't do anything but one thing, let's do this together. Let's pray for one another, let's pray for both of our churches and keep him first. Amen. Keep him first. Lift Him up. Tell about His grace. Tell about His goodness. So when somebody asks you that pivotal question, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Well, how do I do that? Stand back because God may be fixing to do a work in your life. But there's something that Paul and Silas did to that Philippian jailer that I haven't mentioned. They began to read him the Word. There's power in the Word. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He began to read them that Word. 
And that Philippian jailer, as rotten to the core as he may have been, experienced God's grace, and I believe with all certainty that he was saved and secured that day. Was it something that he did? Was it because he fell down in front of Paul and Silas? No, no. It was a work that God did. It was a work that He was doing. And it is a work that He will complete. Preach the Word. Stand on its truth. Don't ever be ashamed of the truth of the Word of God regardless of what anybody else says. Don't ever be ashamed of the truth. Amen and amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I give you thanks and I give you praise that you are the sovereign God. Father, I thank you that you are the one who draws your people to salvation. You are the one who has done it all through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Father, today you may be speaking to hearts here today that for the very first time are beginning to see, the eyes are beginning to come open. And I pray, Father, by the power of that Word and the power of Your Holy Spirit, that that grace go out to those people today, that You touch them as only You can. Father, I can't save them. Brother Brian can't save them. But You can and You save to the uttermost. Lord, I ask that You bless this church. Bless their pastor. Bless this congregation. Help them grow together in love and harmony. Help them to be bold in their witness for You. Father, I want to hear You say, Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen and amen. Brother Brian.